Transcatheter aortic valve replacements, or TAVRs, are often placed in patients with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, for whom surgical aortic valve replacement would be particularly risky. Different TAVR designs, prefabricated in set sizes, are available, and nicely illustrated in this figure recently published by Leon and his colleagues in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. Valves that are grayed out in this figure are no longer available. Valves denoted with a green dot are approved by the FDA and currently available for use in the United States, while yellow dots indicate approval for use in the EU and red dots indicate approval for use in China. A class of mechanically expandable valves known as lotus valves, which were not only repositionable during deployment but retrievable too, were approved by the FDA and by European regulators in the past, but taken off the market in 2020 by Boston Scientific due to problems with their delivery systems and manufacturing challenges. That leaves us with these three families of valves currently available for TAVR in the United States. Several crucial steps must occur during the planning before a TAVR procedure, and one of these is the anatomic assessment of the patient on CT imaging to help determine the appropriate type and size of valve to deploy and evaluating the access route for its insertion. Appropriate sizing matters because paravalvular leak is a strong predictor for higher mortality. CT imaging also helps assess the risk of complications such as aortic annular injury and coronary occlusion and can predict fluoroscopic projection angles that will provide orthogonal views of the aortic valve in the lab. A TAVR planning CT imaging study usually includes two imaging components, a retrospective ECG-gated CTA of the heart and aortic valve in particular, and a CTA of the chest, abdomen, pelvis to allow us to assess the access route for the TAVR procedure and any alternative routes if needed. Unlike coronary CTAs, TAVR planning CT studies usually do not require medication. Colleagues I've worked with generally prefer doing these studies using a single really long contrast injection, usually 150 milliliters of contrast, followed by two CT acquisitions. You do a retrospective ECG-gated CTA of the heart, pause, move back up, and then do a chest, abdomen, pelvis CTA. The advantages of doing a TAVR planning CT this way are that it requires only one breath hold, which is easier on your patient, and only one contrast injection, which is easier for your CT tech. The disadvantage is that you end up with contrast in the right heart chambers, which some purists dislike. There are other ways you'll see TAVR planning CTAs protocoled. Some folks do the two CT acquisitions completely separately, each with their own contrast injection. And as for the retrospective ECG-gated CTA of the heart and aortic valve, some folks choose to use only a 25 milliliter smart prep contrast injection and CT only from the carina to mid heart to see just the aortic valve, which saves IV contrast, but probably provides no ad additional or other clinical benefit. Prospective ECG gated CTA of the heart can reduce radiation dose, but folks have found that around 10% of acquisitions on average could end up being non-diagnostic and need to be repeated. However you do it, you'll hopefully end up with a nice CTA volume of the entire chest, abdomen, pelvis, and a retrospective ECG gated 40 CTA of the aortic valve and heart that's usually presented as a set of 10 CT volumes at 10% intervals through the cardiac cycle. Your interpretation of a TAVR planning CT study begins with a standard non-vascular read of the patient's chest and abdominal pelvic CT. Tasks like counting lung nodules, checking out the liver, looking for bone lesions, and so on. Once you've completed a standard non-vascular read of the chest and abdomen, you're ready to begin assessing the intended access route for the patient's TAVR procedure. While the axial source CT images coming directly off of the CT machine can provide a rough preliminary assessment of the access route, 
dedicated measurements must be performed using a 3D workstation to avoid substantially overestimating some axis vessel diameters. You'll begin by creating two curved planar reformations, one of the abdominal aorta to the right common femoral artery, and one of the abdominal aorta through the left common femoral artery. While most 3D workstations can automatically draw a vascular center line between any two center line dots you drop, with the additional time it often takes to correct the automatic center line by hand, you may find that it's faster to manually drop an entire line of center line dots yourself the old fashioned way. After you've created your CPRs, do a final careful visual check to make sure the center lines are true and then do an export or movie capture of both CPR sets for your referring provider. I'll indicate all suggested imaging captures throughout this talk using a yellow camera icon. Now, you're ready to do measurements, which will require you to linearize your CPRs using the straight MPR tool. Since you need to make sure that the sheath through which the undeployed taver is introduced can actually fit, the diameters you measure need to be luminal diameters and not wall-to-wall -wall diameters like in most other situations in vascular imaging. While many IFUs may allude to mean luminal diameters, what tends to really matter is the shortest axial diameter of the lumen so that the sheath will actually fit. A five millimeter sheath may not fit in the lumen of a 6.5 millimeter mean diameter, diameter vessel if the lumen is say two millimeters in one dimension and 11 millimeters in the other. And be particularly meticulous when you're measuring diameters that are near known cutoff values. Using the straight MPRs, you will identify, measure, and report the minimum short axis luminal diameters of the abdominal aorta and the common iliac, external iliac, and common femoral arteries on both sides. Remember to use the epigastric artery as your boundary between the external iliac and common femoral arteries. Do a short axis image capture of each of these seven vessel sites. Using a combination of the axial source CT images and 3D viewing planes, assess and report the tortuosity and calcification of each of these seven vessel segments too. You can grade both of these characteristics by eyeball, and these are some helpful reference points to refer to. There are a couple of reasons why the amount of vascular calcification matters. In situations where you're dealing with borderline sheath sizing, you might be able to be a little liberal if a vessel is non-calcified since the vessel wall might be able to accommodate a smidge. On the other hand, a vessel with 360 degrees of circumferential calcification may not accommodate whatsoever. Also, the amount and distribution of vessel calcification can predict the likelihood of encountering a vascular complication during the TAVR procedure. In addition to assessing the minimum luminal diameter, tortuosity, and calcification of the aorta, also be mindful to assess for any other potential obstacles that might prevent passage of the undeployed TAVR, such as some of these examples. Finally, in patients with iliofemoral or abdominal aortic disease that might prevent a standard transfemoral approach, provide additional assessments if folks opt for, say, a subclavian or transapical access route for TAVR. Before we begin our aortic valve assessment using our ECG-gated cardiac CTA, perform a standard read of the heart first. Go through your standard cardiac CT workflow, which will probably involve reading the ECG-gated 40 cardiac CTA volume in your 3D workstation. Generally, folks tend to be uh, tend to make less of a fuss about the coronary arteries on a TAVR planning CT, 
um, but they will report coronary artery findings on a TAVR planning CT if those findings are important or potentially actionable. If the patient is post-cabbage, check for bypass grafts less than 15 millimeters behind the sternum since the resultant surgical risk may tilt a case from surgical aortic valve replacement towards TAVR in some borderline situations. Be sure to check the coronary cath and ECHO reports um, that were recently performed. Now we're ready for the main event. Let's begin with a brief review of the aortic valve and its associated anatomy. The aortic valve consists of three thin flaps of tissue that can be referred to as either leaflets or cusps. Each leaflet or cusp is attached to the aortic wall along a U-shaped course. The lowest attachment or insertion point of a leaflet or cusp is here and can also be referred to as the hinge point of the leaflet or cusp. The apices where the attachment sites of any two leaflets meet is a commissure. Now let's focus on the attachments of the aortic leaflets. The aortic annulus is not a separate structure, but a virtual ring defined by the lowest insertion or hinge points of the three aortic valve leaflets. The aortic annulus is sometimes also referred to as the basal ring of the aortic valve. The sinotubular junction is a virtual ring defined by the three commissures. We usually refer to the region between the aortic annulus and sinotubular junction as the aortic root, with the ascending aorta immediately superior to the sinotubular junction and the left ventricular outflow tract immediately inferior to the aortic annulus. The sinuses of Valsalva are anatomic spaces in the aortic root bounded internally by the aortic valve leaflets and externally by outward bulges of the aortic wall. When we measure the sinuses of Valsalva, we'll usually do this at the level of a virtual ring where the outward bulge is most pronounced. In order to help folks appropriately select and size the TAVR they'll be inserting and avoid any foreseeable complications, you'll provide measurements of the aortic annulus and LVOT during systole and a few other measurements during diastole. Uh, we've indicated the systolic ones in red and the diastolic ones here in green. In order to provide all of these measurements accurately, you'll need to work off of a true aortic valve plane using the MPR tool on a 3D workstation. It's a two-step process. One, obtaining a crude aortic valve plane, which takes seconds, and two, fine-tuning the crude aortic valve plane to a true aortic valve plane, which takes a little bit more time, but conceptually pretty straightforward. A true aortic valve plane is defined by three points in space, the lowest insertion point of the right coronary cusp, the lowest insertion point of the left coronary cusp, and the lowest insertion point of the non-coronary cusp. Your strategy is to constrain your crude aortic valve plane to one of these points, then two of these points, and then three of these points. Let's show you step-by-step step how this is actually done on a 3D workstation. Open the cardiac CT volume in a 3D MPR view. You'll typically choose to do this during the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle, somewhere between uh, the 20 to 40% phase. Scroll to the level of the aortic valve on your axial view and position the crosshairs on top of the aortic valve. Now go to your coronal image and rotate the crosshairs to crudely approximate the aortic valve plane on your former axial view. This is your crude aortic valve plane. Now it's time to fine tune it. Translate the crosshairs on your coronal image up and down to identify the lowest insertion point of the right coronary cusp, which is usually near the 12 to 1 o'clock position on your former axial view, like so. And 
position the crosshairs of your former axial view exactly at this point. You've now constrained your former axial plane to one of your three desired points. Rotate the crosshairs on your former axial view so that your former sagittal plane crosses the non-coronary cusp, which always points towards the interatrial septum and is at around the eight o'clock position on the former axial view. Now look at your former sagittal plane. The crosshairs should intersect the lowest insertion point of the right coronary cusp and also intersect somewhere near the lowest insertion point of the non-coronary cusp. Rotate the crosshairs on your former sagittal image so that exactly it exactly crosses the insertion points of both the right coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp. In this particular patient, we got lucky, and it seems like we're already spot on, so we won't need to tweak the crosshairs on the former sagittal image at all. Now, go back to your coronal plane and rotate the crosshairs until the lowest insertion point of the left coronary cusp just barely appears in your former axial image, which gives you your true short axis view through the aortic valve plane. Double check that you're true by scrolling on your short axis view. If you're really in a true aortic valve plane, all three leaflets should disappear on the same image slice. Now you're ready to do your measurements and we'll tackle the two systolic ones first. You'll begin by measuring the aortic annulus at systole. Of all the things you measure, this will probably be the most important. While echo may be used during sizing, measurements of the annulus on transthoracic and transesophageal echo can sometimes be inaccurate due to their less optimal viewing angles, which is why CTA is um, the gold standard. The aortic annulus should appear oval, not circular, in most patients, though it will become a bit more circular after the TAVR has been implanted. The size of the aortic annulus varies a few millimeters between systole and diastole, and folks choose to size a TAVR at systole when the annulus is largest to provide the patient with a snugger fit. Measure and report the long diameter, short diameter, and cross-sectional area of the aortic annulus. The cross-sectional area will be used to back calculate a diameter corresponding to this same area under the assumption of full circularity and used to choose the size of balloon expandable valves. Also report the perimeter of the aortic annulus. This will also be used to back calculate a diameter under the assumption of full circularity and is used to choose the size of self expandable valves. If the annulus is calcified, the convention is to measure halfway through the calcification thickness. Make sure you do an image capture. Assess and report the amount of aortic annular and aortomitral calcification you see. Both are associated with a higher risk of aortic annular rupture during TAVR, especially with balloon expandable TAVRs. You'll then go four millimeters below the aortic annulus and measure the left ventricular outflow tract. Calcified and non-tubular uh, non LVOTs are associated with poorer outcomes, including paravalvular leak and LVOT uh, rupture risk. Measure and report the LVOT's long diameter, short diameter, area, and perimeter, and do an image capture of the LVOT. Once you're done measuring the aortic annulus and LVOT, you're ready to do your diastolic phase measurements. You'll need to change your 40 CT to a diastolic phase, which is usually around 70% into the cardiac cycle. Because the aortic root may have shifted slightly between systole and diastole, you might need to slightly tweak your aortic valve plane on the MPRs before moving on. Most of the diastolic phase measurements are ones that will help folks avoid potential complications. After a TAVR is placed, the native aortic valve cusps are pushed aside and if any of these cusps obstruct the ostium of a coronary artery when pushed aside, the results may be catastrophic. The risks of this sort of complication occurring are higher 
in the setting of heavily or diffusely calcified native aortic valve cusps, long aortic valve cusps, low coronary artery origins, narrow sinuses of Valsalva, and narrow sinotubular junctions, which you'll hopefully recognize if present as you do the following assessments and measurements, beginning with the sinuses of Valsalva. Sinuses of Valsalva that measure under 28 millimeters are associated with a higher risk of coronary artery occlusion after TAVR. You'll measure the sinuses of Valsalva at its widest point and parallel to the aortic annular plane. Measure and report its perimeter and do an image capture. Then measure and report three cusp to commissure distances and do another image capture. This will also be your best opportunity to recognize and report if the aortic valve is bicuspid. Bicuspid aortic valves, most commonly a tricuspid valve with two fused leaflets, are associated with poorer outcomes post-TAVR and carry a higher likelihood of paravalvular leak post-TAVR because their annuluses may be unusually shaped. The sinus heights can be easily obtained next by creating long axis images through the same plane as each of the three cusp to commissure measurements you just did. Creating a long axis image through the plane of the right coronary cusp to commissure measurement line results in a long axis view of the right sinus. Measure and report this distance between the annulus and sinotubular junction. So measure and report the distance between the annulus and sinotubular junction. Call out sinus height measurements under 15 millimeters since the risk of coronary artery occlusion after TAVR is higher. Creating a long axis image through the plane of the left coronary cusp to commissure measurement line results in a long axis view of the left sinus. Measure and report the distance between the annulus and sinotubular junction. Call out sinus height measurements under 15 millimeters. Create a long axis image through the plane um, creating a long axis image um, through the plane of the non-coronary cusp to commissure measurement line results in a long axis view of the non-coronary sinus. This tends to be the longest of the three. Measure and report the distance between the annulus and sinotubular junction. And make sure, as you have with the other images, to um, save um, an image capture. Go back to your short axis view and scroll superior to the left main artery, uh, superiorly to the left main coronary artery origin. Go to a long axis view and measure the left coronary height perpendicularly from the aortic annular plane to the inferior margin of the left main coronary artery ostium. Call out coronary height measurements under 11 millimeters since the risk of coronary artery occlusion after TAVR is higher. Do an image capture. Go back to your short axis view and scroll to the right coronary artery origin. Go to a long axis view and measure the right coronary height perpendicularly from the aortic annular plane to the inferior margin of the right coronary artery ostium. Call out coronary height measurements under 11 millimeters. Do an image capture. Next, you'll measure the diameter of the sinotubular junction perpendicular to its long axis. Report this diameter in two dimensions and do an image capture. The sinus heights you measured between the aortic annular plane and sinotubular junction are indicative of the sinotubular junction height. With balloon expandable TAVRs, low sinotubular junctions are at higher risk of being injured by the balloon. With self-expandable TAVRs, long and narrow sinotubular junctions um, can cause sinus sequestration and impaired coronary artery perfusion. Then, you'll measure the diameter of the ascending aorta perpendicular to its long axis, 4 centimeters above the aortic annulus. Report this diameter in two dimensions and do an image capture. Some referring providers may ask you to provide the angle of the aortic root to help predict fluoroscopic projection angles that will provide orthogonal views of the aortic valve in the lab. To do this, measure the angle between the aortic annular plane and axial imaging plane on a standard coronary CT image, a standard coronal CT image. Do an image capture. If you have a retrospective ECG-gated 4D CT of the heart and aortic valve with CT volumes during each 10% interval of the cardiac cycle, 
you can create a sequence of short axis images of the aortic valve through the entire cardiac cycle that illustrate its motion. Create a cine loop using a five millimeter thick short axis slab through the aortic valve cusps during each phase of the cardiac cycle and do an export or movie capture. And that completes your workflow for a TAVR planning CT study.